Good morning, Fluellen Baptist. We are glad to have you here this morning. We hope you're doing well. We hope you have found extra time to love your family while you're home. Uh, again, for all of you who can't be here today, know that your church is praying for you, that we love you, and that we believe that we are here today to keep the church strong. So again, keep your faith up. If you have any concerns, reach out to your deacons. We're all here for you. We all want to love you any way we can. Maybe it might be from six feet away, but we're going to love you no matter what. Just a reminder that we will have some deacons here between 12 and 1 tomorrow. So if you want to come by and tithe, we'll be glad to have you come by. We'll pray with you, just whatever. Uh, also, you can still give online or via text. Again, we talked about that last week. Patrick talked about how easy it was. He did it in 45 seconds. And we know Patrick can do it in 45 seconds. Now the rest of us can do it in about 30. So anyway, we're glad you're here. We love you. We miss you. And like I said, we sure can't wait to get back together again. But we're going to get started today with a word of prayer, and then we're going to we're enjoy a little bit of church. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for another opportunity, a time where maybe we're not together as a whole, but as a church, we are together because we are with you, Lord. We pray that while we are here today, while they're at home, those who aren't here, that again, you just continue to strengthen each and every one of us. Never let fear win. Lord, thank you again for all that you have given us, Lord. We thank you for your son who died on the cross, who gave us that opportunity to accept a chance, an opportunity where we will get to spend eternity in heaven. So thank you again, dear Lord. Thank you for everything you have done for us. In this we pray in your name. Amen. Good morning, everybody out there in internet land. You know, it's a, it's a different thing. Like Brian said, I, I sure do miss my church family, and I, I've had the blessing of at least getting to talk to a lot of you on the phone uh, and via text and Facebook and online. Uh, but I miss everybody, and it's, it's just not the same. I can't wait till we can get together again. But, uh, you know, when he was praying, I was thinking, but God has provided a way, uh, and, and that's what he does. Uh, you know, when we don't see it, he provides a way for us to worship. And so right now, as we're all sitting at home, in our easy chairs and covered up in our blankets and sitting on the couch, we're able to worship, uh, and he is a way maker.
Hey, man, God is moving. I, we had to cut this because I didn't have my mic on. My bad. I don't know where you're watching from or what you're watching in right now. You might be in your pajamas, in your bedroom, in, in the kitchen, at, sitting around the dinner table with the iPad or laptop out. Let us know that you've tuned in. Let us know. Man, it, that, we tried to make it a more engaging and interactive thing, putting the lyrics up there. I hope you're singing and uh, jumping in. I want to introduce a friend to you. We're changing it up a little bit today. We got the worship team in the house, and Isaiah Moore is here. A few of the Hope Center guys are here too, and uh, supporting him. Come on up, Isaiah. He's a brother and friend. God is putting this. The, he's putting this service together, and he's going to share his story and his testimony and give God glory. So give him your heart. Give him your attention. Isaiah, come on up, brother. What's up, guys? I'm going to do a mic check real quick. Okay. Uh, my name's Isaiah Moore. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. And I'm in recovery for addiction and alcoholism. I'm going to be uh, sharing my story with you guys. I want to tell you guys that I'm thankful to be able to share this story. You know, there's nothing. The word of God says that we're saved by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And I believe that there's somebody out there that needs hope. And that hope is found in Jesus only. So thank you guys for giving me the opportunity. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. I'm going to start from the beginning. Uh, and work my way all the way until now. So, like I said, my name's Isaiah Moore. I'm 22 years old. Uh, both of my parents are construction workers. I actually was an electrician whenever I graduated high school. Uh, I played football, you know, I was always uh, great at sports, played basketball. I had a really good life growing up. Uh, drinking was a part of the family, you know, like there was always drugs around. Of course, construction workers, that's the kind of environment that you're going to be in. But my story really actually starts whenever I was 15 years old. Excuse me for one moment. So whenever I was 15 years old, now I've always been interested in the supernatural realm. I used to watch TV shows like about ghosts, about hauntings and it just always caught my attention. I was actually one of those guys who believed that the world was going to end in 2012 because the Mayan calendar said so. Wouldn't you believe it? But with my interest of that supernatural realm, I opened up doors in my life that I was not prepared to face the consequences to. I actually got into Ouija boards. I got into tarot cards. I got into psychic boards. And I opened up darkness into my life. And I believe that's where it all started. And that darkness followed me throughout my life. And thank God for the Hope Center, I've finally been set free. Thank God for Jesus for bringing me there. So from 15 to about 20 years old, I was drinking, I was partying, I was uh, doing a lot of alcohol, I was missing school. I kind of made up my own rules. Uh, I wasn't abiding by anything, you know, and anything I've ever started, I've usually quit. So. Uh, let's see, and I apologize guys, this is the first time I've ever given my testimony to a crowd, but whenever I was 18 years old, I was actually walking around a store in Books A Million, and this is an encounter that I personally had with God, and as I was walking through the Christian section of the books, I actually dropped my phone, and I had a rubber case around my iPhone, and my phone bounced, and it hit a Bible, and the Bible fell open, and this is the very first verse that I read. It's Isaiah 41.10. Wouldn't you know? You know my name's Isaiah. It says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And I got very emotional because I realized that this was not a coincidence, that God was trying to communicate with me. He told me not to be afraid, but I didn't know what he was talking about. He was talking about what I was about to go through for the next few years. And I didn't realize this until I put it all together. At the, you know, like towards the end of my sobriety, I put all of these pieces together, and then I realized how God had been working in my life the whole time. Uh, so, you know, I felt like God was directly talking to me and telling me this. So I'm like, well, my name's Isaiah. That name's in the Bible. I want to figure out what it means. 
So I figured out that the name Isaiah in Hebrew kind of means God's salvation. Uh, and I literally, I was at Books A Million whenever I looked that up and I read it. So I go from there and I'm going to Joe Muggs to actually get a coffee. And I see these two black ladies and they're standing there. And one of them has a pamphlet in her hand and it says salvation on it. And I was just kind of thrown off. I was like, well, you know, that's not by coincidence either. And so I picked up the pamphlet. I witnessed to these ladies. I told them about how I dropped my phone and the Bible had fallen open in front of me. And I told them I believe that I had an encounter with God. And they said, yeah, you did. This pamphlet was meant for you. So I opened it up and read about it. And that's where I learned about the rise and the fall of mankind. You know, the story of Adam and Eve. So directly after I read that, uh, I went to go get some food. And I went to Zaxby's, actually, in Decatur, Alabama. And I sat down at a table. And I looked up to my left, and there was a football jersey. Uh, and it had a Bible verse on it. And I read that, and it says, Philippians 4.8, that's what it said on the jersey. It said, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. So God was telling me at first not to be afraid, and then he was telling me what to focus on. You know, focus on the good things, the things that are lovely, the things that are praiseworthy in life. So that was the very first encounter with God that I had. But I went through a relationship when I was about 19 years old, and I had my heart broken, and I was introduced to pills. You know, out there on the job site as an electrician, I began taking hydrocodone. I be began taking Adderall. I began drinking. You know, I partied throughout high school, so this kind of carried over. And then uh, I discovered what crystal meth was. I discovered that it was cheaper. And my experience got very, very bad using drugs and doing alcohol. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've been in the ER, you know, how many medical bills that I've had. One story in particular, I was in Bankhead National Wildlife Forest with my friend. And I was in the back of a Ford Ranger. We were going down the road, we were drinking, and we took a curve at about 55 miles an hour, and the truck flipped. And that truck dumped me probably three to five foot away from a huge rock. Now, if it would have dumped me not on that brush and on that rock, I would have been dead. But see, I didn't realize that God had had his hand on me at that time. I got a $19,000 hospital bill from that, even though I sustained no injuries because God protected me. Uh, I took meth so much and I drank so much that I lost multiple jobs, seven jobs currently. And it was just a horrible experience. You know, drugs took over my life. They took over my relationships. And I actually acquired multiple different charges. You know, I got four domestic violence charges and three different DUIs. And I was looking at a lot of time. And uh, I ended up going to Louisiana, you know, further on down the road after this progresses. I go to Louisiana, I start a good job, I get a house, I'm around my family, but my addiction still continues. Uh, hold on, give me one second. Uh, so my addiction is still continuing, you know, and it's very noticeable to my family. And me and my girlfriend, we end up fighting, and we go back to Alabama to visit her family. And we get into a fight one morning, and she calls the police, and I start running, you know, and her parents came and got her. And then me and my mom, we took off, and we went back to Louisiana. So whenever I got to Louisiana, needless to say, I was extremely depressed. You know, she was kind of all I had, and I felt like I didn't have nothing left. I had just lost my job. I was on drugs very bad. And I put a post on Facebook about killing myself. Now, on April 16th, this is from 2018 to now. This is really what I want to kind of highlight on. From April 16th, of 2018 to now is the next story I'm gonna tell you. So God saved my life from the overdoses. I actually 
had a stroke over that period of time. Uh, I accumulated a lot of medical debt from how many times I went to the hospital, you know, Suboxone, Roxy's, drinking and driving. I'd been arrested multiple times. I actually spent two months in jail, where 10 days of that I was in the segregation unit. I had a pickle suit on because I was suicidal. So I struggled with depression, I struggled with anger, I struggled with addiction, and I actually become agoraphobic. I didn't want to leave my house for nothing, not for any circumstance. So the devil tried to isolate me. He tried to completely overwhelm me with depression, overwhelm me with anger to the point of suicide. Now, on April 16th of 2018, I took, I looked at a picture of Jesus that was in my room. You know, I was very, very angry and I was drunk. And I told him, you know, I'm done. I can't handle this anymore. And I took a whole bottle of Adderall, you know, about 900 milligrams. I took a whole bottle of Xanax and I pushed my dresser up against my door and I just kept drinking. I wanted it to be over with. But not only that, I got a knife and I cut both of my legs. It was a watermelon knife about like this. You know, I wasn't playing around. I wasn't just attempting this. I really wanted everything to be over with. And I cut my legs, 28 lacerations. I had 89 stitches. My mom actually called one of my best friends to come to the house and come get me because she was present at the time. And she realized something was really wrong because I wasn't responding whenever she tried to come in my room. And it was a horrible experience. But I ended up making it to the hospital. They sewed me up. Uh, I lived through it, thank God. He was there with me and he had mercy on me. Even though I was so angry and I was so depressed and I was so isolated and so ashamed that I cut myself off from the world. So that was the first time I ever attempted suicide. I sat in the hospital for probably three days and they told me that they had found a recovery center for me to go to. They said it was a year-long program. And I remember that gave me a little bit of hope. But they never showed up. I couldn't understand why. So I remember that day whenever I woke up in the hospital, my best friend, Tyler Thompson, he had sent me a text message. And I read it. And it was Jeremiah 29:11. I'm going to read that to you guys. Uh, it says, oh, I actually didn't put it in my notes right here, so I'm sorry. It says, let me find it. I apologize, guys. Don't mean to keep you waiting out there. Well, I can't pull it up. I'm not getting good service right now. But it says, for I give you hope in a future. I have plans to prosper you, plans for you to succeed, not to harm you. It's something along that era. Uh, I apologize. I can usually quote it right off the top of my head. But I read that verse, you know, and I didn't think nothing of it. And, you know, you fast forward a year later. And I'm in Louisiana, me and my girlfriend had just broken up. And I just completely lost it one day. I went to the doctor with my dad, because I told him I was depressed. I was taking hydrocodone, Xanax, Adderall. You know, I was smoking about an ounce of weed a week. And the worst part was I was drinking about a liter of alcohol every day. So I got to rock bottom once again, about a year later. And my dad took me to the hospital. Or he didn't take me to the hospital. He took me to the doctor. And I told the doctor I suffered from very bad depression issues. And uh, I actually called the doctor. And I cussed him out one night whenever I was drunk. And sorry, I'm really nervous, guys. I don't mean to keep freezing. I cussed him out, and then. I just decided it's over with. 
So I started walking down the road and two police cruisers picked me up and they took me to Lake Charles Memorial Hospital. And that was whenever I got in touch with the director at the Hope Center, Timmy Damesworth. Somebody had seen my Facebook post, her name was Bridget Theo, and she got in touch with Timmy and I got his number. And I actually got Bill Flores' his number as well. And they began to pray with me whenever I was going through my detox in the mental facility. And they said, this is all part of God's plan. We're gonna get you to the Hope Center. And I was very thankful. You know, at the time I didn't understand that this was all part of God's plan. But on April 16th of 2019, I actually arrived at the Hope Center, which was one year like from the previous day where I had tried to kill myself. You know, God's timing was absolutely perfect. He had this plan from the very beginning. And I walked into the office after speaking with Timmy, arms wide open. He said, I love you and I'll be your brother to the end. And we're gonna help you get through this. And I walked into the office and I looked up on the wall and I saw the scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I have plans for you, plans to give you hope and a future, plans not to harm you, but to prosper you. And I immediately knew that God had me right where he wanted me. And on April 8th of this year, I'll be one year sober. You know, thank God for the Hope Center. Thank God for, for Jesus taking me through all those trials and tribulations. I know what it's like to have addiction, to be bound by chains of anger, depression, but he set me free from all of that. And I live a new life now. You know, I'm, I'm so thankful that he kept me alive over the period where I had a stroke, you know, all the times I've overdosed. And this cross actually is called a clinging cross. I held on to it and I just kept praying, you know, even whenever I felt like I had lost hope. So I'm thankful for what God's done for me in my life. And I'm glad that I got to share this story. You know, this is my first time, so. But thank you guys for letting me share, share my story. Uh, if there's anybody out there struggling with addiction, I just want to let you know that God sees your every move. You just have to put your trust and your faith in him. Amen. He delivered me and I'm living proof. And his word to you guys that I feel like he's given me today, it's uh, Isaiah 9, 6. It says, for to us a son is born, to us a child is given. The government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, <coughs> Almighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So with everything going on in the world right now, I just want to let you know that the government is on his shoulders. So put your hope and your faith in Jesus. He'll save you. He saved me. Uh, Pastor Nix, thank you so much for letting me come up here. I appreciate it, guys. Amen. Uh, if we can have a word of prayer, please. Lord God, thank you for another opportunity uh, to gather together to do this online. Thank you for providing a way for us. And Lord, thank you for the Hope Center. Uh, Lord, they're touching lives. And not just within the Hope Center, Lord, but they're touching lives in the community. Uh, you know, they're, they're showing us your love. They're showing us your healing power. Uh, and I know I've witnessed it myself, God. I, I just pray that you would continue to just pour the Holy Spirit over this program, over these men. And Lord, uh, just pull them closer to you. And God, uh, anyone else who's out there that's struggling with these addictions, I, I pray that, that they would know there's, there's someone they can call on, uh, that they can always turn to you in those times, Lord. So just, just be with us as we move forward. And uh, help us to stay in your light. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
I'm sorry. <laughs> Boy, I think, I think about your testimony, Isaiah, and I think about that song. And that's, uh, man, that's your story. Uh, I, uh, man, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I, I'm out of words. <laughs> Anybody who knows me, that doesn't happen real often. <laughs> um, you know, I... I've met Isaiah a couple of times. Uh, don't know him real well. But I can tell you this. Have you ever shook somebody's hand and just felt the spirit in them? Have you ever met a guy that, I mean, you have barely spoke to. You've just shaken his hand and you can see that joy that he carries with him. Man, God bless you. Carry that. I, I mean, and you've just, uh, you've touched me. So, God bless you.
I don't know about you, we're having church in here. <laughs> so we hope that that's communicated and that you're joining with us. Let's go to God in prayer, may we? Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the resurrection power that you said, the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that woke Jesus up is the Holy Spirit that you plant and that you graft into us as believers. May we live in that. May we stand in your love. Thank you for the witness and the testimony, the miracle of salvation that we witness in other believers. In Jesus' name we pray and give you thanks. Amen. Is this time to have a message? All right. Good deal. All right. I, I began to think maybe I got it off. Hey, we're going to be in Mark chapter 10, and I'm just going to dive in real quick. I gave most of my time to Isaiah because I knew the Lord had given him the message, and, and I just want to kind of... Um, I heard a preacher say, I want to be a toothpick. You've already done had the meal. I just want to knock something loose of what he shared, okay? And so let me be that for just a minute, all right? In Mark chapter 10, uh, Jesus is approached by a few different people. And, and in this world in which we live, I, I, I heard somebody say the other day, how many of you have seen the movie, and you kids that are tuning in, uh, let us know, you've seen the movie Tangled. You know the story about Rapunzel. You know what I'm talking about? Any of you guys here want to own it? All right. So in the movie Tangled, Rapunzel is quarantined. She's on, you know, she has to sit at home, stay at home order. And she's in the kingdom. Get this. The land where she's quarantined is the, is the kingdom of Corona. Interesting. Now, you may be thinking we're living in this new kingdom called Corona. And Corona is dictating. <laughs> it's issuing the new orders and everything is kind of rolling off of that. Can I say that, you know, this, the only thing more contagious than this coronavirus is the fear that it's sending out also. People are scared to death of how it's going to impact them physically, uh, spiritually, and, and, and maybe, you know, because they're isolated emotionally, but also it's impacting them, you know, in a lot of other ways, financially, relationally. I mean, it impacts jobs. I've got friends who've lost jobs because of this. And so, you know, there's a lot of fear involved. And so the, the, the Lord's kind of using this, uh, this text in my life to lift my eyes above and out of this kingdom. In the movie, the movie is not the authority, the movie's not the text, but it gives an interesting thought that she stared at the window and she would look out over or she would lay in a room and look at the sky. She fixed her eyes above the kingdom. And it reminded me of the verse where when Jesus said all, was gonna, all hell was going to break loose, the kingdom of darkness was going to come, this judgment was going to come, he said, when these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is near. Interesting. When these things start happening and things look terrible here, lift up your heads. I think he was probably quoting from David when David said, I will lift up mine eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And so in, in, in me, it's been, let's look over this. Let's look above this because when you begin to look here, it, it can be kind of discouraging and disappointing. Here in this text, Mark chapter 10, if you found it also, I want to remind you that if you want to take this lesson further, uh, you can print or download the study guide, the questions with it, and it'll kind of take this text a little further if you want to go further in your study. Uh, the first thing we see is we see people bringing children to Jesus. Verse 13, and they're bringing their little children to Jesus so that he could touch them. He was very approachable and he wanted to, to love on them. And maybe they, we don't know what their expectations were. Maybe they needed healed. Maybe they just wanted to be near Jesus. And you find out that his disciples, his own disciples, started rebuking them. They were telling people, no, 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 you can't do that. They were scolding these parents and these kids. Now, Jesus is welcoming them, but the religious group, the religious folk, are trying to monopolize or control the Jesus that they know. We don't really know why. Maybe, he, maybe they thought Jesus was too busy. Maybe they thought Jesus uh, uh, didn't have the time or the energy. Maybe they wanted him to themselves. We don't really know why, but they, and, and let me say this. We've got to really, if you're a Christian, you've been around church a while, you and I, we need to really pray against this idea of controlling things because we can get in our head we can get in our hearts that that the holy spirit that christianity or the church 
can be something that we can monopolize or hold over people. And it's been done for centuries. It's been done for millennia. And it's wrong. It's time that we understand that ministry and the ministry is the ministry of grace and this grace is free. So he took these children in their arms and laid hands on them and blessed them. And as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him. I'm in verse number 17. And he knelt down before Jesus and he said, Rabbi, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, I find this question very interesting. He asked the wrong question. He asked the right person. He asked Jesus about eternal life, but he said, what must I, what did he say? Do to inherit eternal life. Where, what can I do so that eternal life comes my way? Now, I want to stop right here for a minute. I need your interactivity, okay? So I want you to think about this for a minute. When it comes to salvation, because he uses two phrases here. He's talking about the kingdom of God, and he's talking about eternal life. Now, those do have some overlap, but I'm going to show you they're not the same thing. Let me ask you. When you got saved, when you trusted Jesus as your personal Savior, like Isaiah spoke of, when, when the Lord Jesus gripped your heart and you yielded to Him, is salvation merely a get-out-of-hell-free card? Yes or no? It's not. You know that there's more that Jesus desires. The Christian life is way more than just one moment of salvation. It's way more than just one decision. It's way more than just one moment. That's just the beginning. Would you agree with me? If you agree with me, would you look at the person next to you and say, I agree with that? Because that's the truth. Now, that's where you may have eternal life, but you may not be technically part of the kingdom of God. Now, before you lynch me for preaching heresy, let me tell you what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is where Jesus is king in your life. Behind us, you may have seen on the stage, Shane, I don't know if you've got a wide view, if it'll pick it up or not, but we've got two crosses. We've got one that says Lord and one that says Savior. You may have seen them if you've been to church here before. And there's a big difference in Jesus being your Savior and Jesus being your Lord. The idea of Savior is He sets you free from sin, He's taken away the payment, and you're going to heaven. But a lot of people walk through this life as Christians, but not truly making Jesus their Lord or their King. And when, unless Jesus is your King, truly you're not in the kingdom of God. You might be His child, you might be in the family of God, but the whole New Testament here that we see is, is pointing us to a deeper... And, and so what He says is, he says, what can I do to inherit eternal life? And so Jesus puts it to him. Okay, you want to do something? You've got to do all the commandments. And he says, done. I've done that. I have not killed. I haven't uh, stolen. I haven't defrauded. I've honored my father and mother. Now, he might have lied right there. I tend to think he did. He was probably stretching it. He was hiding probably behind his own self-righteousness. But even still, the Lord didn't argue with him. He just said, okay, here's what you do. You're a rich man. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor. And then come and follow me. And, and he was grieved, the Bible says. He, he was dismayed by this. He went away grieved because he had many possessions. That was a huge task. He lived in great wealth and great comfort. I don't even know if, if Jesus told many of us today, this is what you have to do. Would we truly be able to do it? You see, what he did was he, he touched the moment that he knew this is the part of surrender. This is the part of yielding. Are you looking just to get me out of, uh, for me to get you out of hell? Or are you looking for, to follow me and for me to be your king? Is Jesus your savior or is he your king and Lord? There's a big difference there. So Jesus begins to talk about, oh, it is so hard for someone who is wealthy to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, we all have different views of wealth. You might, you might think of someone, I mean, I, we've been watching a television show called Pool Kings lately. And these people are building these pools. And, and I, we were talking, Joy and I were talking, we were like, how much do these pools cost? I have no idea. I think we're off because one time they were dropping in this panel of acrylic. So that it, it, the one side of the pool, it was concrete, but one side of the pool was this big four foot acrylic, looked like glass. And it was like 18 or 20 foot wide. That one piece of plastic cost $25,000. And I thought, yeah, I think that they're wealthy. Yeah. Now, that's my standards. 
Now, I'm not going to make you feel guilty for making money, all right? I, there's a whole lot of that today, and that's not the point of this. But you realize that if you, even if you make a minimum wage, you're part of the wealthiest 2% of the world. You're, you're part of the wealthiest in the world 2%. Now, again, this... Don't feel guilty for making more than minimum wage. Don't feel guilty for having a, a union job or union income or, or being blessed by that. No, what he's saying is if you're comfortable, if you're well off, if your, things are, your needs are taken care of, guess what? It is really hard for you to come to the place where you yield to a king. It's just, and, and everybody looks at him and says, well, how can these things be? Then who can get saved? He says in verse, they say in verse 26, if this is the case, Jesus, Jesus even said it this way, it's, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And I love what Jesus said here. He, said, he looks at them and says, with man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. All things are possible with God. I have a confession to make. Several weeks ago, the Lord's been on me about this concept of a, of a miracle. What is a miracle? We talk about, man, that was a miracle. How many of you would raise your hand, even through the video, those of you who are here, how many would say that Isaiah's story, that was miraculous, that was a God, that was supernatural, that was a God thing? Raise your hand. Yeah. Uh, Y'all raising it out there in TV land? Now listen, I, that was miraculous. Now maybe you don't think your story is miraculous, but let me tell you what God says. Here's what the Savior there says. If you have wealth, if you are rich and blessed, and you still have yielded and have Jesus as your king, you belong to a different kingdom, that's a miracle. People would say it's impossible. God says nothing's impossible with God. In other words, it's a miracle. So a few weeks ago, God was really on my heart about making Easter this year about miracles. I even thought about calling it a, a miracle service or a healing service. And I'm not talking about, you know, getting Benny, up here, Benny Hinn up here to swing his suit coat around. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the miracles of, of Jesus breaking chains, of the Holy Spirit setting people free. I'm talking about the miracle of people getting saved. Amen. And so that's where I was. But I didn't have the courage to use those words. Because, you know, I'm a pretty pious Baptist. I'm a pretty fleshly man that didn't want to. And then, and then the Lord's been just working with me. Hey, you know what? We need, to, we need to share the miracle of our salvation with this lost world. You don't know this. Isaiah stepped off the stage and he was like, I'm sorry. I was like, dude, man, it was, don't be sorry. If you haven't already and that testimony blessed you, let him know. Let him know through the comments. I don't know if he's got Facebook or all that stuff, but we'll print them out. We'll share them with him. If you're here, part of the praise team, and you haven't already, do, do let him know. If it blessed you, let him know. I'm going to tell you this, that miracles are real, and the salvation of a soul is a miracle. The power of a testimony, he just put it out there. So I think, whether we have service here or not for Easter, I want Easter Sunday. It, I hope that Easter Sunday is a day that we blitz the world, that we cover the world with the, the witness of a miracle. What do I mean by that? I mean that you will share your testimony, that you will record yourself or you will type it out in some way that you will share your testimony. What if we don't get to gather here on Easter? But we turn Easter inside out and we put the resurrection and the power of the resurrection that we just witnessed this morning. What if we put it out and cover the entire internet with it? What if we cover this entire community with it? I, I, I tell you what, I, uh, I think that the Lord Jesus would be so pleased to see that he rules and that, that people witness his kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven. That's, that's my challenge. That's my heart. He even quoted a scripture that talks about the kingdom of God. This little baby coming. And he shall be called th this wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. I want to ask the worship team to come up. We're going to sing one more song. I'm just putting that in your heart. I'm challenging you at home. Let's begin to think about how that we can take our testimony, the miracle of our salvation, 
that we as blessed, as rich, as wealthy people have had the impossibility of being introduced to the grace of God. And as Jesus said, you come to me like this little child in humility, in faith, with excitement and anticipation. And unlike this rich young ruler who turned and walked away grieved, that we have chased after and followed after Jesus. I pray that you will join me in that mission and that effort. Will you sing this song, parents, children, families, sing it out to the glory of the Lord. This is what, this has been my anthem all week. It's carried me through some of the dark days. Will you join us as we sing? Father, thank you that you are in our midst. Thank you that you are way maker. We do stand in your love, but remind us of who we are in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. been a real blessing to be able to do this uh you know patrick had a great challenge um, and i think i guess that that's going to start with asking yourself a question and that's who are you who do you belong to uh, you know and if you don't know that come please contact us call us facebook messages uh yeah, my number is 615-569-3742 I'll get you in touch with somebody. I'll pray with you myself. Uh, but if you don't know who you are and who you belong to, right now is a great time to find out. So you've heard testimonies. You've heard the word. If we can just pray together, and we'll close the service. Lord God, thank you. You're a loving God. And there are so many messages that could be given. 
Lord, your love. You are the very definition of love. And I just pray right now that that love pours out over Facebook and over YouTube and over where, however people are hearing this word right now. God, I just pray that you would that you would pour love out. Just let people feel it in such a way they've never felt it before, Lord. Let this be the day that people start the rest of their lives. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.